Was, was everyone at the session I did earlier? Curiosity. Oh, that's good, because I only, well, well, that's good, because I only have about three jokes. <laughs> I'm going to use the same ones. Uh, <coughs> what I want to, to finish, because this, this is a, a kind of workshop, what I want to do is, is share with you some of the visualizations, the strategies that people have used around the world. I've been collecting visualizations for like years now, uh, strategies that people have been using to heal themselves of injury, illness, disease, exactly what they did and how long they did it for. And, and then set you a little, like, a little task where you've got to figure one out for yourself. It might be something that you're dealing with or something that you know someone else is dealing with. Just to give you an idea of how you actually do these. But just, just as a recap, I believe that visualization, when we're imagining, when we're using the mind to have a physical or a physiological, biological impact in the body, I believe it goes through a neuroplasticity approach. So earlier I was talking about how <clears throat> the brain doesn't distinguish real from imaginary. And I've got my wee clicker again. <clears throat> so that, <clears throat> just to recap on this study. So this was done at Harvard by a very world famous neuroscientist called uh, Alvaro Pascal Leon, <clears throat> published in the Journal of Neurophysiology. And they basically got a group of volunteers to play five notes on a piano, plunk, 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 up and down a scale for two hours on five consecutive days, homing in on the regions of the brain, which is these fingerprint areas of the brain. They found that after five days, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the fingerprint region had grown by a factor of about 30 to 40 times. Now, what's really happening there is if you think of brain cells like your hands, and you, it's like you're growing extra fingers, and the fingers are reaching out and connecting with another hand. Like, a, like two trees, for example, one tree reaches out and connects with another one, but vastly multiplies its branches in all directions. So what you get is, it's called neuroplasticity, literally growth of the fibers and connection, or the wiring in the brain. So five days of going plunk, 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 plunk for two hours a day cause massive rewiring of the brain. Five days of imagining doing the same thing. So instead of going plunk, plunk, plunk with your fingers, they had to imagine going plunk, 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 plunk with the fingers for the same two hours and five consecutive days. And as you can see, it's exactly the same. If you count the pixels, it's a 97% overlay there. So literally, within error margins, the brain does not distinguish between real and imaginary. So I've interviewed people all over the world, collected stories, testimonies. And what's consistent in almost every single one of these stories is people take a picture of illness in their mind and turn it into a picture of wellness and they do it over and over and over again. Just like they plunk, 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 plunk with the fingers. The only way to affect neuroplasticity in the brain, the only way to get neuroplasticity in the brain is to physically move or to think the same thought over and over and over again. So doing the same movement creates neuroplasticity. Thinking the same thing creates neuroplasticity. So I'll give you a few examples of the actual, sto the actual uh, recoveries people made. So that earlier I said the, the most common or regularly used example of people who had cancer but who were getting chemotherapy is they imagine the chemo drugs as little piranha fish going <coughs> nibbling the tumours. The tumours get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until and well, it's gone. Picture of illness converted into a picture of wellness. Re repetition, and they do it over and over and over again. So every single day, the same thing, smaller and smaller, smaller, gone. Smaller and smaller, smaller, gone. Illness, smaller and smaller, smaller, wellness, gone. Over and over and over again. People in radiotherapy imagine the radiation is bolts of lightning going, pchum, 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 burning chunks out of the tumour. So again, smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, gone. Uh, people who, some people actually just imagine tumours, Multiple tumours, for example, as ice, and just imagine the ice melting. So sometimes they imagine heat lamps or uh, crystals melting the, the, the ice, and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And then what they sometimes do is imagine mopping all the liquid up, wringing it into an imaginary bucket, and taking it out and throwing it away. I, I met a person who had a chronic kidney disease, so a kidney function down to about 5 or 10%. And every single day for a year, imagined going to her kidney cells, one cell at a time, 
And in the disease state, had imagined these cells to be like kind of shriveled up. You know the way your finger goes if you're in the bath too long and it sh the skin shriv shrivels up? So they imagined the kidney cells as like kind of shriveled up, but sickly and gray looking. And that was in the disease state. So in our mind's eye, what she did every single day is imagine giving each cell a little bit of, just one cell at a time, a little drink of nutrition. And then imagine taking a cloth and a healing liquid that she just defined as a healing, cleansing liquid and just cleaned the cells one at a time and just cleaned and polished them. And as she cleaned them in her mind's eye, each cell went from its shriveled, gray, sickly looking to a bulbous, healthy pink and really restored every cell to a bulbous pink color. Took the next cell, shriveled gray, gave it some medicine, cleaned it with a cloth, cleaning fluid, and restored, went from the disease, illness, state of illness being the shriveled and gray, to wellness, which is a healthy bump, bald as pink. A year later, I bumped into, because I'd, I'd shared an example like that at a conference, and the following year, I met her again at the conference, and she came up quite teary-eyed and said, you probably wouldn't remember me last year, but I was in the audience when you shared the kidney visualization. Well, at that time, I'd just been diagnosed with about, I think it was five, or it was just under 10% kidney function. And, I just, and she, she got really emotional, as she said, and I just wanted to say that as of last week, I've been discharged and my kidney function is perfectly normal again. And that's what I did put religiously for a year. And I think these kind of things go through a neuroplasticity approach. The science hasn't been fully investigated. I explained this morning about the mind-body connection. That's the best of the science that I'm aware of that links the mind and the body. The, so when you think about something, it changes your biochemistry, which if impacts your blood chemistry, impacts your immune system, your cardiovascular system. At the same time, you stimulate the nervous system right into your joints, into your muscles. But as far as visualization for serious illness goes, I'm just, I can only share with you examples that I've personally collected. So as far as the science goes, this is how I think it works. And it's because people do the same visualization over and over and over again. Repetition, repetition, repetition. I'll give you a couple of more examples. Autoimmune conditions and allergies are kind of similar. So the, they both start with what's called a type 1 autoimmune reaction. So someone who has, let's say, hay fever, classic hay fever visualization, highly effective. With hay fever, the immune system is like it's hyper and alert. So like a bit of pollen comes in, the immune system goes, pollen, get it! It kicks it and beats it. You know, it's that kind of, it's that kind of hyper, got to get it. The immune system thinks it's protecting you. So that's that whole thing. So the visualization that people found very effective for hay fever and other aller similar allergies where the immune system thinks it's protecting you but it's actually too hyper, is they imagine talking to the immune system and saying, look, it's actually fine. So the visualization is you imagine the chief immune cell who's telling the rest of the immune cells what to do and say, hey, check, it's fine, absolutely fine. I know you're trying to protect me. See that wee bit of pollen? Check it out. Let it come. And the immune system, get, let, it, let me get it, let me get it. And you go, no, chill it, let it go. Watch the bit of pollen dancing around. Look at that. No harm at all. See that? Let the pollen go from now on. It does absolutely no harm. Why don't you take the day off? Or at least chill out a wee bit. And I know several people who've done that visualization for hay fever and not get any more symptoms for the entire summer. Similarly, an autoimmune condition is very similar. It starts with a type 1 autoimmune reaction, meaning the immune system is like that. But instead of attacking something from the outside, it's attacking something on the inside. So diabetes 1, for example, the immune system is attacking the pancreas, islet cells in the pancreas. MS, it's a myelin sheath. Lupus, it's the kidneys. And other, the skin. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, it's the joints. Uh, I met a friend, well, a, a now friend, I suppose, a, a lady I've kept in touch with over the years, several years ago had lupus. And with lupus, it's, lupus comes from the Latin for wolf. And so what she decided to do is tame the wolf inside of her. And so the wolf represented the immune system that was angry and over, overactive. So in her mind's eye, over several months, Several times a day, she'd close her eyes and imagine stroking the mane of the wolf. So, and every now and then, if she got stressed about something, she imagined the wolf was really angry, ah re getting really angry and attacking stuff and clawing at things. But gradually, she would talk to it, kiss its imaginary head and tell it how much she loved it and how grateful she was for its presence in her life. Even if she's sitting watching a TV, in her mind's eye, she's 
stroking the mane of the wolf. And I think it took about eight months, and she was completely off all lupus drugs and totally into remission. And that's pretty much all she did. I've got another friend who had a condition called myasthenia gravis. And that's an autoimmune condition where the immune system attacks a little substance in the brain that's got to get from one brain cell to another. So imagine this stage area was the end of one brain cell, and that's the beginning of another. And the little chemical, it's called acetylcholine, has got to get from there and swim across here. But what happens is the immune system thinks it's an invader. The immune system's hyper, going to get it. And as soon as the immune system sees it, it gobbles it up. So this, this guy, Drew, he'd been diagnosed with, myothen with myothenia gravis and told that this is, basically this is you now. There's nothing else we can do. He was on steroids. His weight had went up to over 20 stone with, through the steroid reactions. And he was suffering really badly. And he went on a... a a course to learn vibrational medicine, which is a bit like homeopathy. Uh, a, a doctor, actually, Helen Petro, who was based in, or think still is in Nairn, and was learning, the visual, was learning the vibrational medicine and collapsed at the workshop. And she took him home to her own house and said, I have to, you're too sick to travel home, so I'll have to tend to you here. And she basically kept him at her own house for a few months, took him off all the, the drugs that he was on, replaced them with homeopathic vibrational medicine treatments, and he began to respond a little bit. And there was one day he was at Plaskarden Abbey in Fife, and he was listening to Gregorian chants, and all of his symptoms just spontaneously disappeared for a, a period of time, just literally gone. And he was breathing clearly. When I first met him, he couldn't speak. He used to have to hold his face up because all the muscles had lost all function, and he was like that, and he was trying to speak through, and it was very difficult to hear what he was saying because he had no muscle function there. And yet, he was sitting up in the abbey, symptom-free. So what changed his mind was the belief that he'd accepted the prognosis, there's nothing we can do, this is you now, and he said, that's not true at all. Maybe that's just where medicine is right now. And he, he thought to times in the past, uh, where stuff that is now routinely curable was not, able, was not curable 50 years ago. In fact, some of the stuff we're doing now would look like it was a Harry Potter film compared to 100 years ago or so. And he said, well, maybe that's, it isn't that we can't, medicine can't do anything, it's just we don't know how to yet. So he decided it must be curable. If he was symptom-free, listening to Gregorian chants, there must be a possibility. So that's when we met, actually, came in one of my, my day workshops, and we did an exercise that we're actually just about to do, where I asked the audience, the group, to create a visualization, a strategy based on turning a, an idea of illness into an idea of wellness, something that you would do every single day. And he decided his picture was, if the little chemical is swimming across and the immune system's attacking it, he pictured the immune system as a piranha, just gobbling up. So in his mind's eye, he imagined he was camped out in his brain and he had a child's pop gun. You know the ones you get the fair gun that, that shoot corks? And whenever he saw, uh, and I, I always caution against the use of violence. Notice this wasn't an Uzi 9mm or anything. It was a playful thing. I always caution against the use of violence in your own imagination, in your own body. And so in his mind's eye, as soon as he saw the piranha of the immune system about to gobble this little chemical, he shot it in the backside with a cork. And the, immune, the, the piranha went, ah, like that, distracted it, the little chemical got to the other side. And he did that over and over and over again, repetitively, over and over and over again. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Anyway, about 11 months later, he had completely recovered. In fact, his doctor, who's a, a specialist at Nine Wells in Dundee, actually, and I quote, Mr. Pride, you are the only person I have ever heard of who has completely recovered from myasthenia gravis. And so his, his combination was vibrational medicine, i.e. homeopathy, coupled with a visualization, a daily dose of repetitive over and over and over again. So you notice that these different medical conditions, I picked some quite different things, but the strategy is exactly the same. You take an idea of illness and you convert it into an idea of wellness and you do it over and over and over again. How you do it is entirely up to yourself. I know a lady who had a tumor that had metastasized, cancer that had metastasized around the body, and imagined the spread as like branches of a tree. 
So over a year or so, she imagined pruning the tree. And she would go to the branches and say, I love you very much and thank you for being in my life. But I have to let you go now. And she'd give the little twig a little kiss, take some shears, snip it off, throw it out of the body. And over a year or so, pruned it all down, smaller and smaller and smaller. So in her mind's eye, gradually all the branches got pruned right down to absolutely nothing. I met this lady at a workshop I was leading at a cancer center. I, I teach about three, uh, three cancer centers in the UK. I run visualization, mind-body science workshops. Not, in, not that people t- do this instead of medical advice. Just if you weren't er- here earlier, I, I tried to make the point. Using your mind isn't instead of of taking medical advice, whatever that advice is. It's not instead of changing your diet. It's not instead of changing your lifestyle. It's whatever else you're doing, you use your mind as well. Instead of, for example, getting stressed or frustrated or angry about things, you're using your mind in a positive, constructive way. And it's my belief that doing so causes a neuroplastic effect in the brain. And because the brain doesn't distinguish real from imaginary, that begins to have a corresponding effect inside the body. That's what I believe happens. But I would always caution against doing this instead of whatever else you're doing. So this is in, in addition to whatever else you're doing. I think that's just being sensible, really. But you'll notice that the strategies for all of these things are exactly the same. Illness turned into wellness over and over and over again. And I'm repeating the point intentionally over and over and over again to get it into our heads of just how important that aspect of it actually is. So here's a wee exercise. And let's just take five minutes for this. Talk to the person beside you, or if you're in a wee three, use a wee three, and pick a medical condition. It might be something you're dealing with just now, or it might be something that you're aware of someone else is dealing with, and see if you can come up with an illness converted into wellness strategy. Uh, do it. I'll give you five minutes. You might find that you go through it fairly quickly, and you can do one for each of you. But just to give you an idea of the process of what it's actually like to work out a strategy. So an idea of illness, convert it into an idea of wellness, right? Just take five minutes. Right. How'd you get on with that? Anyone willing to share a visualization you came up with? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Lovely. <laughs> Brilliant. 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 And I think, see, the, the brain is always talking to the body. So what we tell ourselves, our, our brain, if you like, through the repetition of what we imagine or what we say, I believe eventually communicates with the body. And so it's, li- it's almost like we're talking to the body. There's a version of this kind of thing called that people talk to their cells, cell talk. And people literally talk to the cells and say, what do you need from me? Is there any change in behavior you need? And it sounds kind of daft. But it's something's worth a try. Some people just close their eyes and as if they're doing mindfulness of how does the body feel, they actually say to a damaged or an injured part of the body, is there anything you need to tell me that I could be changing about my diet, about my lifestyle, about my stress levels, about even something, could you share with me a visualization that would work? And that's something I've come across quite a lot, that kind of idea, especially for sporting injuries and stuff that feels kind of tight and, and restricted and stuff. So, excellent. Anyone else like to share a visualization? It's somebody's useful just to hear what other people are doing because it sparks ideas in your own mind as well. Go here. Um, I have as part of my ideas um, that the reflux. So Do you want to try the, this just in case people at the back can't hear you? <laughs> um, I have IBS and acid reflux, so I'm going to visualize um, a wee traffic board in, inside me flowing the food through my system. Um, allowing it to actually just stop, take heed, put the nutrients into the body, and then just gently release it. Brilliant. So. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks very much. Incidentally, uh, what's quite common 
I, IBS, it's often with some people connected with fibromyalgia and can acid reflux, and, and there's a great growing body of evidence that suggests increasing oxytocin in the body has a very direct, almost surgical effect, and it, it actually increases a, what's called gastric motility, is the movement of the stuff down through the body and, and out. And, and one of the simple ways to increase oxytocin is to hug people more, uh, to be kind to people, but also to be kind to yourself. Uh, and so uh, sometimes self-care and self-compassion, saying, what do I need to nourish myself? And sometimes that self-nourishing, uh, I've come across quite a few people in some areas of research suggesting that self-compassion and self-nourishment, nourishing does actually have an effect on that kind of combination of the IBS and the, the acid reflux thing, coupled with fibromyalgia, aldo, which is very common, little triangle that a lot of people get, kind of similar, yeah. So... Nourish yourself. Does anyone, actually, does anyone have any questions? Because I've tried to cover this kind of stuff quite quickly. Uh, does anyone have any questions about that kind of stuff, stuff that you wouldn't mind getting a wee bit of clarification on? We've, we've been talking about physical things. Yeah. Here, and the visualizations we can do for physical things. Yeah. What about if it's mood or emotion? Brilliant. Good question. Let me share with you a couple of visualizations. A, a very good depression visualization, a, a guy I met a number of years ago, a, he had been told by friends, oh, you've got to try this visualization thing. And he said, well, it's how do I do a, a non-physical thing? Visualizations for a physical thing. And the, the, the answer is to pick something that symbolizes. See, the brain works in symbols, not even so much as physical things. The brain, long before language became the norm for us, we communicated through gesture and symbols. So in the brain is a highly developed system of understanding symbols. So you can make a symbol to picture something. So for example, this guy said, okay, well, I feel broken. He said, I felt shattered, just broken. My life had just broken. I felt broken inside. So he pictured that as a mirror that had fallen and shattered on the ground. So that's, il that's illness, and you want to turn that into wellness. So in his mind's eye, what he did is he swept up the shards of the mirror with a brush and pan. He put them in a cauldron. He lit a fire underneath it, and he melted the mirror until it was liquid, liquid mirror. And then he imagined a, 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 new, a new mold, shape of a heart, for example, or a, a circle, and he poured the melted mirror into it, blew on it, and, re and cooled it down, held it up, and he'd recast himself. So he'd taken brokenness, and he'd made himself whole again. Illness was the brokenness, wholeness was the wellness. And he did it every single day. And some days he struggled with it. He said, I felt depressed for years. It was really hard, but I, I persevered with it. And he said, after a month, six weeks or so, he said, I felt like a new man. And this was like a couple of years on, he shared his visualization. And I've come across a number of people now have used a similar symbolic, I call it a symbolic visualization. If it's not a physical thing, you can symbolize it. My mum is a classic example. So my mum... Uh, after having postnatal depression in 1976, when my youngest sister was born, postnatal depression wasn't understood very well in the 70s. The advice my mum was given was to give yourself a shake. <laughs> now, to ask a woman with postnatal depression to give herself a shake is probably something like asking someone with a broken knee to just run it off. And so my mum developed this complex of feeling stupid. I can't tell the doctor I feel stupid. You've got anxiety about going to the doctor. For years, my mum had panic attacks. She couldn't go into a, a shopping centre if it got too busy. She couldn't go on holiday unless she was staying in the ground floor right beside a window that she could open and she knew she could get to the front door. Mum had panic attacks for, I don't know, 25, 28 years. She'd tried all manner of different techniques and nothing had really stuck. I'd been trying to tell her visualisation. It went in one ear and out the other. Until she came to a conference and heard me talking about visualization. He said, why haven't you talk, not talk, talked to me about that before? <laughs> and it's funny, family tend not to realize until you actually s perceive you as someone else <laughs> standing on a stage. So my mom, my mom came up with a visualization that night. So every night, she would have a panic attack, a really anxiety attack going to her bed. The moment she went to bed and lay down, it was a, the panic about what's happening in her life and, and what's tomorrow going to bring. And it was a real physical sweating and everything. So my mum decided that night, after I spoke in the conference that day, so that night my mum went to bed and she closed her eyes, could feel the anxiety coming, and she said, how do I feel? It's like the word panic 
is a big word and it's sharp and it's right in my face. So in her mind's eye, she would go out of bed and imagine walking downstairs into the kitchen and she went into the drawer, kitchen drawer, and she took out a pair of scissors, the kitchen scissors. In her mind's eye, she imagined coming back up to bed and cut up the word panic with the scissors as if it was made of paper and cut it up into lots of wee chunks until it all just fell in the bed. Then she picked it up in her hands, scrunched it up like that. In her mind's eye, she walked back downstairs, out the back, opened the blue bin, <laughs> shoved it in, slammed it shut. Imagine going back up to bed, lay in bed, took a breath, opened her eyes, and that was the last panic attack my mum had, and that was in September 2012. And my mum had gone, I think, 28 years of anxiety and panic attacks and has not had a panic attack for four and a half years. She does that visualization most nights. She likes to top it up so to speak, not uh, just because she knows it works for her, so why not keep doing it? And she understands that the brain interprets that as she's getting rid of the panic. She's taking control of the panic. So a symbolic visualization is something we, we make a, sim a symbol of it, but still using illness to wellness strategy. So my mum's was, illness was the word panic right in her face, cuts it up, wellness is crunching it up and putting it in the bin, it's gone now. So it's symbolic of the process, but the key is repetition, repetition, repetition. So very, very powerful strategy. Thanks for the question. How much is the visualization linked to an incredibly strong belief system that sport and struggle trying to get the belief? Mm. Yeah, it, it's one of the reasons why I, I teach the science. It's one of the reasons why I show brain scans. It's one of the reasons, like, for those of you who weren't here earlier uh, today, I, I often share my background. So I was a scientist with one of the world's biggest pharmaceutical companies building drugs for heart disease and cancer. I saw the mind-body connection working in the placebo effect. So I started to study the placebo effect. What happens when you believe something and belief itself or the expectation of something happening actually drives the change in your brain chemistry, the change in your blood chemistry. Uh, so the reason why I teach the science and I use brain scans and stuff is to build that little bit of belief that you understand that it's impossible to have a repetitive thought without changing the structure of your brain. Providing you think the same thought, whether it's illness, whether it's getting to the end product of wellness and keep thinking the same thought. On some level, the brain has to process it. If you had to think of someone you love every single day, then the, the love area of the brain would increase. If you had to think of stress and frustration every day, you would wire the brain for stress and frustration. The brain literally follows what you do. So the reason why I teach this stuff like this is to give you that little bit of faith. The second little bit of belief in yourself. The second thing is try and just notice, try the techniques out and notice the changes yourself. And as you notice quite quickly, some of the small changes that begin to happen in how you feel and how your body's working, that begins to build belief. So you start to build your own belief based on what you're doing in your mind and noticing the results that you're actually getting. So that's my formula as the two things together is, is read a wee bit, read up in some of the signs. Take a, a photograph. The reason why I put that reference there for everyone's benefit is Google the paper. Go on to, go on to the Google and get a hold of the PDF of the paper it's, as well. It's called Mo Modulation of Muscle Responses Evoked by Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation During the Acquisition of New Fine Motor skill, skill. A bit of a mouthful. It basically means the brain can't distinguish between real and imaginary is roughly what the paper was, was describing. Uh, so the reason I put things like this up is so that you can read up on things yourself or, or you know, read a good book. I, I've written a few on the mind-body connection. I'm not trying to plug my own books, but it, it is good stuff because uh, it's got signs and stories of people that have used that kind of stuff. Uh, so educating yourself a wee bit to build your belief and then just noticing some of the changes that occur in your own body as you practice some of the techniques. But thanks for the question. It's really good for everyone to hear that, actually. Yeah, of course is you there, can. Is there a danger that the reverse can happen? Can you, if you believe, you know, can you make, say, a, you know, a cancer worse by believing it's getting worse? Uh, I don't know. I, 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 do you know what? I don't invest much focus on 
the negative side of things. I, I prefer to say, here is a reality that a, a person is facing. What can I do about it? So I actually don't think about it, to be really honest with you. I don't think belief can create an illness. I, I don't. I was more thinking that we had a friend who was given three weeks. Yeah. And three weeks later, he was awake. And it was a case of, well, if you think, if you did the positive visualization, I, I read a statistic once, and I, don't, I haven't followed this up myself, so I, I can't honestly say how correct it is, but uh, in, in some countries, drugs for terminally ill patients are packaged differently because if you take away what the drug's for, and in some countries, the families are allowed to, I think I read it was Japan, and I don't know for absolute certain, if the person knows how sick they are, then they tend to, symptoms get worse. But if someone doesn't know that they're, they're terminally ill, for example, then they live a lot longer. It's like a bumblebee, aerodynamically, a bumblebee should not be able to fly, but it doesn't know that. <laughs> and it's probably just as well. So I, I think there's a lot in that. I, I, th I read somewhere, and again, I've not followed this up personally, so I haven't m investigated it, but I think it, it's probably fairly true that uh, more people get worse quicker when they believe there isn't any hope. And I did speak with a consultant, an oncology consultant once who came to one of my workshops at, the, at one of the, the, the breast cancer haven in Fulham that I, I usually teach twice a year at. And, and he said that he, be, he does anything he can to give his patients hope. Because sometimes just that little bit of hope <laughs> takes a, even a wee bit of the stress away. So he shares with them techniques like this, for example, and other things just to give people a little bit of hope, knowing that that little bit of hope and positive expectation must at least do something relative to believing that there's nothing you can do. So that's a kind of long answer for the same thing, but, but I, I think it's good to have hope. I really do. I really do believe that. I've probably got time for one more question, and then we're, I'm trying to stick to Susie's time. Of course you can, yeah. An emotional eater. Uh, I, I've not come across any specific examples, to be really honest, with that. But what you could do is create a symbol, a, something symbolic of it, and turn it into something else, if that makes sense. So what, if you could think of something symbolically that emotional eating would be, like if, for example, it was even something as simple as, as water gushing out a tap, and that was symbolizing it to you, then you might turn the tap off. And at least imagine gradually turning off and gradually the water beginning to get weaker and weaker and weaker. And that's symbolizing the emotion beginning to, to tone down, so to speak. So something like along those kind of lines would be a good starting point, actually. So uh, I just want to, I'll finish with a, a, a wee story that's a, a visualization story for when you imagine yourself as the next highest version of yourself. And I think when you imagine that kind of stuff, it can have extraordinary effects. So I'll, I'll give you one bizarre thing that happened to me. So I went through this wee phase when I was doing a lot of meditation and I was imagining, a, a, and I was imagining that if it, your highest spiritual potential, for example, would be like a being of light and you'd be pure light. So I imagined uh, that I was walking my dog at the time. This was a couple of years ago. He, he passed away a few years ago. And I was walking with him and I imagined this like a being of light as your highest potential and imagine stepping into it like that and flexing big golden angel wings and imagine in the light penetrating right down to my cells till my cells and my DNA and my atoms became translucent and I just imagined that and, and breathed it and then I went like that, I imagined going poof, and imagined extending the light out as far as I could see to the trees in the distance there and imagine feeling as if I was, the trees were part of my body and the rocks and the, the mountains were part of my body. And I, I did that several times a day when I was out and about, trying to imagine this highest state that you could attain that the body could hold in, uh, 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 you know, the way we live our lives. And all manner of weird shit, uh, sorry, stuff <laughs> started to happen. And, and I'll give you one example, right? So I was giving a talk in London. I'd arrived in, uh, near my hotel near Covent Garden in London, and I was due to speak at a conference the next day, and I'd run out of deodorant. And I walked out onto the street and I was chucking it down my rain. I didn't have a jacket. I was pretty much dressed like this. And I thought, damn it. 
I need to get, I'm going to get soaked. And I was using men's Dove deodorant. And I thought, well, I know what I'll do. I'll put on my Being of Light suit. <laughs> right down to the cells. Poof, and extend myself to a quarter of a mile. Imaginary. And, I'll, and I thought, I'll try and feel a Dove deodorant. <laughs> Sound a bit kind of crazy. And I thought, I feel like I should turn left. So I'm walking down the road. And after about 50 metres, I stopped abruptly and I said, wait a minute. Do you know, if that's true, this, that you're pure light, maybe everything's connected to everything else. Maybe everything's part of the same thing. And I said, so that means I'm already part of a every Dove deodorant in London. And it's just like me summoning my hand to my chest. There's no different from summoning a Dove deodorant. So I stopped like that and I said, I should be able to just put my hands out. And a men's Dove deodorant should just land in my hand. And I stood there actually in the Covent Garden for about 20 seconds and I stopped after a while, but I had such a clear thought, I'm sure I absolutely feel that should happen. Maybe it's just the, the mind that says it can't. And I'm standing there like that. And I decided not to do it much longer because a being of light suit doesn't have, actually have a hood. <laughs> it's made of light. <laughs> so I walked around the corner, found a shop, got my dove deodorant. Anyway, the following week, I'm about, I'm, boarding a, I'm about to board my flight from Edinburgh to Heathrow Airport. I was giving a lecture in London that night, Friday night. And BA, British Airways, had just announced a four-hour delay in my flight. And I'm going, oh, shit. I mean, damn it. I'm going to, I'm going to miss my lecture. What am I going to do? And I thought, there's always a solution. You know, always an answer, always a way. I'm just like, right, what, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? On the board, Gatwick Airport, flight closing. Over at the BA desk, excuse me, any chance I'm giving a lecture in London tonight, four-hour delay, I'm going to miss my lecture. Could I jump on the Gatwick flight? BA staff were great. No problem at all, sir. New boarding pass. I was on the flight to Gatwick. Now, I fly Edinburgh to Heathrow once or twice a month, and I get off at Heathrow Airport, I get the Heathrow Express train to, uh, to uh, Paddington Station. I do it all the time. I know Paddington Station at the back of my hands. But this time, arriving in Gatwick, I had to get the Gatwick Express to Victoria Station. I'd only been in Victoria once, really big station. It's weird shape as well. It's got five exits. And I was walking about Victoria going, where in the damn am I? I'm a bit kind of lost. I wasn't paying attention. And I bumped into this young girl. And Needle took her off her feet because a bit of momentum. She was quite short. And I, I'm like, oh, really sorry. And I grabbed her shoulders. You know, in this modern world, you need to be careful what you do with your hands. And I was immediately sensitive to that. And I went, oh, I'm really sorry. And she looked at me. And she dropped her men's dove deodorant in my hands. <laughs> Are you kidding? No, I swear to God. I swear to and I'm looking at that, and, and she didn't place it, she dropped it, and it landed in my hand. And I'm looking for a few seconds, try to take in the gravity <laughs> of what actually just transpired here. And I just went, score! Woo! <laughs> and I don't know how many people in Victoria turned around, what the what's going on like that? And, uh, and you know, there was, a men, there was a Dove deodorant promotion taking place in Victoria Station. And she was one of the marketing girls, she just so happened to have one in her hand. And so when I opened my hands like that, and she saw me standing like that, she just dropped it in my hand. So anyway, I just want to finish with a story that if you could extend your ideas of visualization out into your hopes and your dreams, and just give some idea to maybe it's possible that you can, uh, not only the brain can't distinguish real from imaginary in here, but perhaps the same thing might extend out in your life. And maybe, just maybe, by imagining living your dreams, some weird shit might, uh, stuff might happen <laughs> in the process. I'm not suggesting we all summon dove deodorants, but maybe you, could su maybe you could summon your dream. So anyway, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I hope you've had a great conference. I think uh, Pete or Susie's going to sum up. But thanks for listening to me. I hope that was really useful for you. If I don't see you again, enjoy the rest of your life.